everybody. Um, I was raised by a strong mother and a strong father, and we still spend a lot of time together. And you know what happens when you spend time with your parents? You sometimes hear stories about your childhood that you did not know before. Well, I just got one of those, and the story was about when I was two and a half, my mother went back to work, and this was 1970. And she left then myself and my six-month-old brother in childcare. And guess what? We went to the now nursery school and child care center. It was the first of its kind in the country, now being National Organization for Women, and it was in Pittsburgh. So now in reflection, I have realized that these early childhood experiences I have have imprinted themselves on me. I went to a woman's college, and I'm an avid collector of stories and research and passionate things regarding women and leadership. And I'm going to share a lot of that with you today. And I feel very lucky, very lucky that I have had wonderful mentors, as I know all of you have had in your careers, that have helped you become the person that you are today. But I have had some challenges. Um, as was just mentioned, I just took over as CEO. And two months ago, we had a vendor coming in to pitch to us. And it was very apparent to everyone in the room that they thought they were selling to the ultimate decision maker of the gray-haired gentleman on my left. <laughs> or backtrack, in the late 1990s, my husband and I bought our first house. And it was quaint in a well-established neighborhood and 70 years old with very drafty old windows. So we're both working. So I go racing out of work to get home to meet with the window contractor to talk about replacing these. And so I get there. And he says, where's your husband? And he refused in the late 1990s to even take a meeting to have the pitch for just me as a decision maker, wanted my husband to be there at the same time. So this is a truly inspirational time that we are in, one of transition, one of a lot of change, one of a lot of awareness and opportunity. So this talk is for all the women in the audience and the women out there, but it's also for the men who are mentoring, leading, managing, and fathers of this generation of women in leadership and the next generation of women in leadership. So the Super Bowl's coming up this weekend, which is my favorite time to watch commercials. All right. So one of the commercials that aired last year is this one. It was the Like a Girl commercial by Always. So by show of hands, how many of you have seen this commercial? It is an incredibly powerful commercial, and it went out all over social media. And when I have polled people what their reaction was to the commercial, interesting people talk about how sad they felt. They felt sad because what it perfectly depicts is that confidence in young women plummets when they go through puberty. They also felt incredibly frustrated because it takes the term girl and the phrase like a girl and it becomes something that is negative, stereotyped, and a label. And others felt inspired to want to reclaim that and make it something strong and powerful. And I felt inspired to make sure that women at work and leadership is not something that's also stereotyped and labeled, which is why this speech is called Lead Like a Girl. Now, this is truly a time where people are focusing on that, and Bonnie talked about this. This is not just, though, a woman's issue, women in work. This is truly a business issue, and I'm going to show you why through a couple of data points. So the first one, there is undisputed data that the more women you have, the greater diversity you have in an organization, the higher financial performance. I like to peg the um, FTSE, which the Barclays Women's Leadership Index pegs against the FTSE, and they show that. Uh, DDI last year did a research project with the conference board, and we looked at top 20% and bottom 20% of financial performing organizations, and the top 20% have twice as many women in them as the lower 20%. Now, if you don't like this kind of data, perhaps you like the place you go to for all your business knowledge. 
That is the Shark Tank. If you aren't aware, it's a program where we have the sharks who in essence are venture capitalists. They hear pitches from future CEOs with their ideas and they listen to them. They decide which they want to fund. Some of the CEOs coming to them are men and some are women. Well, this gentleman here, who's Kevin O'Leary, he's known as Mr. Wonderful, was quoted last year in the Huffington Post as saying that he's making more money from the companies that have women CEOs than men CEOs. So, I don't know, which, what do you like, you know, FTSE data or Kevin O'Leary? I mean, either way, make it a really good point. So, this is a really interesting time for all of us because economists will tell us that the global income for women is currently 13 trillion. That's gonna swell to 18 trillion over the next five years, which makes women the largest emerging market in the world. That makes it a larger emerging market than India, larger than China. So that means women power, that means women having influence over politics, sports, business, and society. So we know that this greater diversity and inclusion is absolutely critical. But as Eileen pointed out, we have had very little change in the past decade. In fact, women make up 87, sorry, 57% of college graduates. So you've got a great pool of future workers and future leaders. But at the same time, they only make up 53% of the workforce and by the time they get up to the executive ranks, the C-level, they make up less than 20%. Fortune 500 CEOs, only 5% of those are women. And there are more CEOs named John than there are women CEOs. So people then say, well, there's got to be something here, something in the mix that's happening that's, that's saying why men will ascend faster than women. So people say it must be a difference in the skills. Men bring different skills to the table than women. And if I had time, I would poll you all and say, finish the following sentence. Women are better at, men are better at. And I've done this many times, and I get some really interesting response. On the women's side, women are better communicating, building teams, planning and organizing. On the men's side, negotiation, strategy, and delegating. Clearly, those are the skills that are going to get you to the top. But the question is, is this really true? Is there truly a skill cap, or is this just a perception? So at DDI, we spend a lot of time looking and assessing people to look for the differences between candidate A and the skills they have and candidate B. And we will tell you definitively which is the one that you should promote to the next level. We do this by a, a, what we call simulations and assessments. And what that is is like a flight simulator. So, you know, you throw a pilot in to see if they can take off the plane, fly the plane, and land the plane. We throw a leader in to see what their behaviors are. What do they say and they do? And we get a true, objective, third-party assessor measure of them against these skills. So, we've now called a seminal study of 15, sorry, 10 years and 15,000 leaders around the world on these skills looking for differences. And there are some. So it probably is not surprising that, for example, networking is a skill that we see that is possessed in banking and finance, but is not a skill that we see in heavy manufacturing. There are definitely some skill differences. So we looked at men and women, and guess what? There were no statistically significant skill differences, and I am a psychologist, so I can say that, right? No skill differences between the men and the women. Men can just as easily be good at communicating, building teams, and planning and organizing, and women just as much negotiating strategy and delegating. So, but we hear about it all the time. You hear it cited. And why is that? Because I think we all like to sensationalize and talk about the differences. And there are books, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, that again, talk about these differences, or data sets that are really, really small. But the bottom line is, it's not skill that's holding us back. So what is it? Well, for that, what I really think is something that struck me as my own personal wake-up call. And about seven years ago, I was tapped to take over a new business venture for DDI. And when I did, I was stepping up to something that was new. I inherited a team that had two senior women that were part of it. They had more tenure and more experience than I did. 
And, they had, and then we also had a gentleman, we'll call him George, that came in from the outside of DDI, but he had held some very senior positions himself externally. So we are working hard. We've got heads down. I've spun up all these teams. We're working on the technology implications. I'm taking meetings with the senior team all the time on my Gantt charts and the progress that I've got, working really hard. In fact, I'm off. Uh, we've innovated, and I'm doing a pilot. And I'm sitting there, and I'm really excited because one of the th things we know that makes for success is get everybody jazzed internally before you take that external launch, right? So I get this email, and I hit play, and it's from our de mar marketing department. And in that marketing video, it says, welcome to the new thing that we were launching. And whose face is there but George's? So here I am thinking that if I work really hard, that this next job, which was a vice president job, that would have been beyond the R&D, R&D would have been a small function underneath it, would have been mine. And yet George had been spending a lot of his time angling in to talk about why he felt he was the right person for that. So I didn't let sleeping dogs lie. I declared myself. I put together my business case about why I was the right person for that position, why I was not going to let that rug get pulled out from underneath me for the future, and why I was going to be able to be successful in that role. And we did it. We created a product that was hugely successful, was able to grow double digits over the next couple of years, and for that, I'm really proud. I got a lot of learning experience from that. But I have a question for you all. If this is a continuum you see here on the screen, where are you currently? I'm going to ask you to pick a number in your head. Are you more on the wait for it and expect good things to come because you're doing hard work? Or are you asking and declaring? What number would you put in your head? Got it? All right. Now do it again. Where do you want to be? What number do you want to be? Got it? Show of hands, how many of you were two or more points away from where you wanted to be? Yep, that's pretty common. So what it really gets down to is one of the key differences between men and women is what's talked about as the confidence gap. And you may know this HP study. HP several years ago did a study where they had a uh, job opening and they had say 10 criteria that you needed for the job. Women would only go for that job opening when they felt they already had 100% of the criteria for that future position. Men would go for it when they had 60%. 60% is good enough. Nobody has everything they need before they get there. So this is an opportunity for us to build confidence. So I'm a really pragmatic person. So I cannot let you all out of here without giving you some pointers and some tips that I've collected through the years on what it will take to build confidence for ourselves, for the women that we lead, and, and um, particularly for leaders. So what I like about it is this is incredibly actionable as well because the other thing about this is I'm hoping to give you some things that when you walk out of here, you will be able to do differently when it comes on Monday. So let's get started. The first one is Amy Cuddy. I love Amy Cuddy. You probably know her. She's a Harvard researcher. She studies the link between body language and confidence. She's got like the number two TED talk out there. And her new book, Presence, is just exceptional. And Amy talks about how when you are in a challenging situation, when you're about to have a big negotiation or one of the toughest conversations of your life, or say, come step out onto the stage of the Country Music Hall of Fame, that you should spend two minutes backstage in a power pose. What that does is help center you, and it will calm your nerves, it will provide you with courage, and you will come across as more leader-like. And this is critical because an HBR study recently just surveyed men and women. 88% of them feel that executive presence is critical to make it to the C-suite. So the great thing about Amy, though, is Doing this once is helpful, but doing it several times actually changes you. And not only are you feeling more confident, you truly become more confident. So her motto is not fake it till you make it. It's fake it till you become it. It's like building that muscle memory that truly makes a difference. So we know to build confidence, 
body language matters. But I also truly believe that words matter. And there are things that we should start saying and stop saying that show other people that we are confident or less than confident. And so here comes this list. The first tip is mentally promote yourself. You've probably all read uh, Watkins' book, The First 90 Days. He talks about promoting yourself into that next level of leadership. Well, just like what Amy Cuddy says, if you mentally promote yourself and get yourself there, the confident words and the language are going to start to come out of you, and you will find yourself acting and saying things very differently and in a confident tone. The first of which is using I language as opposed to we language. I have many times done an exercise with people where I have told them, turn to a partner and tell them an example of a time when a team of which you were the leader accomplished something, a great goal, a great success. Tell them that story. After we've done this, I've asked the partners to say, which pronoun did you hear more often? I or we? Well, guess what? We comes out more often in the women audiences than the I. Now, I am not suggesting that we all need to become overly self-promotional. I'm also not suggesting that we should abandon the phrase, there is no I in team. But who is on that job interview? Your whole team or you? And who was the leader in this particular case? So I language comes across as far more confident. There's another one which is using phrases like I'm confident or I am sure or I know as opposed to I hope, I feel, and I think. And in fact, I heard myself five minutes ago saying the word I hope. That's one of the ones that I do wrong all the time and I have work colleagues who check me on it. They're like, you just sent an update message and you said, I hope you find this tool useful. And they're like, why did I not be more confident in how I was talking? So that's another tip for you. And the final one is we're not in this alone. We need to encourage others to find their voice, the quiet people, the ones we know who have a perspective, a subject matter expertise. We need to help them, and we need to create a community that is going to help others be more confident and be able to promote themselves. So while this is the start list, I have a few things that are on the stop list. And in fact, these first three sort of go together. So here we go. All three of these phrases are undermining you before you even get the sentence out. You're apologizing your way to the table. And I can't tell you how often, if you start listening, you will hear these phrases. Another one is, oh, sorry, just. Well, we're not going back. Um, another one is just. You may have seen the beautiful LinkedIn story about the word just. There is a big difference between communicating with somebody saying, I'm just checking in on how the report's going, and saying, can you give me a status update on the report? The just is a permission word that is softening things. So just as a tip, there is a, if you use Gmail, there's a Gmail add-in. Oh! I told you, I just empowered you all to listen for that and look at that, excellent job. <laughs> As a tip, if you use Gmail, there's a plugin that will scan your message before you hit send for words like just and like sorry, which are the less confident words. That works for anybody. So, love this quote, a woman's like a tea bag, you never know how strong she is until she gets in hot water. Eleanor Roosevelt, very brilliant woman. But it also makes me think of a story that I have a good friend, she's a senior woman executive, and she told me that she has been told by a gentleman that, oh, I know why you're so successful and so strong. It's because you act like a man. <laughs> and that's not the point. We're not trying to have women act like men and men act like women. The point is, we are all trying to live in the Groundhog Day movie. Now, you're saying, why? And I know you figured it out, because I already said I'm from Pittsburgh, and the movie, Bill Murray is that weatherman who travels to Punxsutawney outside of Pittsburgh and gets trapped for uh, over and over and over again living the same day. 
you're close. But it's because of the moral of the story. He gets trapped till he reinvents himself, himself and becomes the best ever version of himself that he can be. And so that is what I'm confident that you can do for yourselves and the people that you lead. And I also am confident, I don't hope, I'm confident that you got some wisdom here today. Did you? Some wisdom? If you were... All right, so then you now have to pay that forward. I want you to pass on some tips to your colleagues, women leaders that you work with, on what they can do to declare themselves, act more confidently, and for anybody to become the best ever version of themselves. And if you could, do it on Twitter, because and hashtag lead like a girl, as well as tag me, because I have a microsite feed of this, and, and every time I speak, we can see all the things that are being passed along for that. And so that is your goal. You feeling good about that? All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I am confident that you all can go be the best ever version of yourself that you can be. Thank you very much. Yeah.